so the talk I'm going to give is going to tell you a little bit about uh, the four changes that I made to lose 229 pounds. Uh, so that was me. Uh, this is November 2010. So I'm going to like, kind of go back in, in time. So you have to pretend like you can't see me here. Like, that's me. Like, just pretend. That was the only, it, when I say it was November, it was actually, this was October. That was my Halloween costume. That was the only costume I could find that fit. And it was just bunny ears with my normal clothes, right? Um, my friend made me wear a Halloween costume, and that was my way of, of revolting and saying, I'm not going to wear a Halloween costume. This is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to get bunny ears, and that's it. And about a week later, I would make a decision to change. So I wanted to start off tonight by telling a little story. This is a story that you may or may not be familiar with, but it's something that has really resonated with me as I've made this change. And it's about a Cherokee grandfather, and he's meeting with his grandson, who is struggling. You know, he's going through puberty. I see a lot of parents. Anyone have teenage kids or had teenage kids? So you know, like they're insane. Sorry to the teenagers. Right? They're a little crazy. And so the teenage son, grandson is going through these challenges. And the grandfather says, when I was your age, I had these same problems. There are two wolves that are battling inside of you. And one of them is filled with anger and frustration and is ready to fight and is struggling with carnal desires. And the other one is, is loving and values family. And the grandson said, well, which wolf? And they're fighting. You know, and he said, which wolf wins? Which wolf lives? And the grandfather replies, whichever one you feed, whichever one you feed. So to give you a little bit of a confession, I, I spent the first 31 years of my life feeding the wrong wolf, feeding the wrong wolf. And not only was I feeding him, I was, I was definitely overfeeding him. I was giving him way more than he required. Uh, I really believe that I always had the potential to be this healthy version of myself. I always had it. I mean, it's not like I woke up and I, I was a different person one day and that's why I was able to make this change. It was just that I was not feeding the right wolf. I wasn't catering to the right desires. I wasn't becoming the right version of me. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about that and what that means to me later uh, in the talk. But psychology and, and brain science is starting to actually verify this. And, I, I'm not going to geek out with you about brain science because I don't want anyone to fall asleep tonight, but we're starting to understand the brain in ways that we've never understood it before. And what we're realizing is there are parts of our brains that actually trigger certain things inside of us. There's a, there's a part of your brain that triggers the I will, the willpower part of your brain, right? I can do this. I can make this happen. And then there's a part of your brain that says I won't, meaning like I'm not going to eat that cheesecake, right? Uh, I'm not going to have that red cream soda. You know, I'm not going to make that happen. And then there's that part of your brain that, that triggers your cravings, like what you actually want and what is most important to you. And those three, sometimes they fight. In fact, a lot of the times they fight. And for the first 31 years of my life, I just let one of them win for the whole time. I just let him win. He was winning. He was the only one I was choosing to feed. And he was having a lot of that, that red cream soda. So to kind of fast forward to tell you a little bit about my story, uh, these are my two daughters, um, Rebecca and Jaina, ages nine and six. Uh, I am 35 years old now. I work as the director of marketing in a small construction company. I want to start off the talk by telling you that I am not like a fitness salesperson. So there's no shakes at the end of this meeting. I'm not going to sell you pills. If you go to my website, in fact, a lot of people are confused. They go to my website and they visit it and they email me, okay, okay, but, but like how, like what do I give you? Like what are you selling? And I'm like, no, there's not, like I don't have anything, that's it. Um, I work as a consultant and I, I bill my time pretty expensively, to give you an idea. And this isn't like to brag, but my time is typically billed at $250 an hour. And as a weight loss consultant, I have never charged a single dollar. I've written everything I've done for free. I respond to every single email I get. Um, even the crazy ones, like I, I respond to everything. Uh, this is a labor of love for me. This is a labor of love for me. And this is, I do this strictly because I love to do it. And there's no other reason behind me being here. So if you're waiting for the end part where I like hook you and try to like get you to do something, that, that's not going to come. So just be comfortable and everybody can have fun tonight because there's no hook at the end of this, this talk. So 
I want to kind of go back to history and I want to talk a little bit about when I first knew that I was obese. So I like to tell people that when I was born, I was, I was an average weight. That was like the only time in my life. That's me as a baby. Uh, true story. This kind of got cut off, but that is an LA Rams teddy bear uh, behind me. My mom is a huge Rams fan. Uh, true story, at the age of, I would have been three months, was the first time and the only time for years that the LA Rams were in the Super Bowl. And I was in my baby carrier, and if you were a Rams fan, first of all, I'm sorry. Second of all, you know that they had a lot of bad years and they were losing to the Steelers. And my mother, who is the football fan, not my dad, was slamming the table, you know, every time the other team would score, which was often. And I was gradually inching closer towards the table. And my dad tells people he saved my life. So if only I was heavier, I might not have moved so far. Um, but as a baby, I wasn't heavy. I, I was fine. But that didn't last very long. My mom loves telling the story that as a toddler, my first word, true story, was Dorito. That was my first word as a baby. And there, you know, if you read my writing, if you've been on my site, you know that Doritos are frequently mentioned in my posts. I, I, love, I love Doritos. I love talking about them. I haven't eaten them since I started my diet, but we'll talk about that more later. So growing up, she had kept this book uh, my mom, you know, she wanted to be a scrapbooker, I think, but she never did it very well. So she did this book and every year she would fill it out and she would tell details like what I was into that year, you know, what I wanted to be when I grew up, what my favorite subjects were, who my best friends were. There was also a place to put my, my age and my weight. So this is fifth grade. I was 10 years old at the end of the year. I weighed 120 pounds and I was five feet tall and I looked really good in a short white t-shirt, you know, that was, that was me, you know. Um, that was the year when I really started to look heavy and when I knew. Uh, the teacher actually commented on my report card that year that I was having trouble with coordination. I wasn't moving fluently. They were worried about my physical dexterity, my physical skills. Something interesting happens the next year in the book and the weight stops getting recorded. The weight just stops. We don't, we don't talk about that anymore. We stopped talking about it in my house. See, family was a secure place for me. Uh, my parents both worked in food service, so I grew up in restaurants, and we got to go out to eat a lot. And when we went out to eat, I could order whatever I wanted on the menu, and that was never salad, right? I was 10, I was 12, I was not ordering the salad. I was ordering something deep fried or something with pasta, or preferably both. Uh, that, was, that was my reality. Um, I was also a big time closet eater, so I found a lot of security in food. One of my guilty pleasures was ice cream. Anybody know what I, okay, good, all right, somebody. So what I would do is I would sneak down, downstairs at night, and I would grab a half gallon of ice cream, I would put it in the microwave, and I would microwave it for 15 seconds or 20 seconds, um, and I would stop it with one second left, and so nobody would hear the microwave going off, and then I would just eat a half gallon of ice cream. That's what I would do, I was a closet eater. People would say, Tim, I don't know how you're so heavy, or in a nicer way than that, because I never see you eat anything. And that was reality, because I was a closet eater. When I would, hide, when I would eat, I would hide. But food was my security blanket. I was Linus, that was, food was always there for me. Good day, I could, re I could celebrate with food. Bad day, I could cry in a bowl of ice cream. And I would put it back with three or four bites left my parents never said anything. They never confronted me on this for years. Never said a word. Why does the ice cream keep disappearing? I made three pounds of pasta last night and now there's like seven strands. I actually would, would tell them that I slept walked. I, I lied, I told them I was a sleepwalker and I, I went downstairs, I must have eaten it, right? I would make excuses, I was a closet eater and I was ashamed. So fast forward to graduation, I was definitely heavy set. But it didn't matter because my family, they, they loved me, you know, like my, my family was obese. And these are the stories that I would tell myself. At first they would tell me, oh, he's going to grow. He's going to be tall. You know, both my parents were tall. Um, and so they said it was only a matter of time. Once he grew, then he would thin out. And I grew and I, I didn't really thin out. I just kind of stayed the same. Uh, but and then I said, well, you know, it runs in my family. Everyone in my family is obese. There's nothing I can do. I'm big boned. Right? I, I'm big boned or I'm stocky. This is just how I'm naturally built. So fast forward uh, to Halloween 2010. 
I'm 31 years old. I am 440 pounds. 440 pounds. On the outside, I'm happy, right? In this picture, I'm smiling. People love, like, oh, you look so happy. But on the inside, I was, I was dying. I was depressed. I was miserable. I was contemplating suicide all the time. And frankly, I was acting on it by doing this to myself. And in other ways as well. I struggled with manic depression. I didn't know where to find myself. My family had fallen apart. Uh, my wife left me after the birth of our first child, came back, we got back together, separated again a few times. Everything in my life on the outside appeared to be good. People didn't know all these things were taking place, but on the inside, I was completely conflicted. That other wolf was starting to have his way with me. And I had hit absolute rock bottom. Absolute rock bottom. So to kind of go back one second, had I ever tried losing weight before? Well, yeah, let, I'm going to tell you about three of the big attempts on the way here that I tried to lose weight. And I named each attempt after a Beatles record, just because I, I don't know, it, it seemed fitting. So the first one is yesterday, and this will make sense in a second. So what happened is I was in eighth grade, right? And any guys that ever went through eighth grade, you notice like right about this time is when you first start noticing girls, right? And so I met Jean, and Jean was my best friend in the world. My best friend in the world. And I loved Jean with all my heart, but I would never tell her that because I was overweight and I didn't think she would like me. Um, until one day I did. I did. It was eighth grade. There was a summer camp. There was this moment where we all were crying because there was some touching play. And we all thought this was the moment. And so I went to Jean. I said, I got to tell you, I'm in love with you. Here's my moment. And she said, hey, you remember your best friend Omar? He has pecs and abs and I kind of like him better. Ouch, right? That was my first attempt. So what did I do? I said, okay, Omar has pecs and abs and great hair. That's not his real hair. That was a costume. But he was amazing and charismatic and dynamic. And the best part about Omar is he was so funny. And you know, really good for him. Um, so I decided I would lose weight. And so what I did is I locked myself in my room every night and I did sit-ups to the same song over and over and over. And that song was Yesterday by the Beatles. I, don't, I still don't know why I chose that song. But what happened is every time the chorus came on, I had to do sit-ups, right? And my dad found out and he said, I want to help you. I'm going to take you to Weight Watchers. And sure enough, I went to Weight Watchers and it worked for me. I went to the support groups and I actually did get skinny for a minute, for a minute. Um, but of course, all the weight would come back and it would bring friends with it when it did. Um, but I was happy for a time and it actually worked out. The support groups actually were really successful for me, I found. So that was attempt one. It didn't work out in the end. I relapsed. I yo-yoed. And I'm not the only yo-yo dieter, I hope, in the room. I was kind of hoping that was not the case. So strike two. Uh, this one is called She Loves You, right? Finally, she loved me back. So I did not understand true love until the day that I met Rebecca. Rebecca was my first child. We had struggled with infertility for a few years and I left my job uh, and was headed to a new job in between insurance. And of course, that's the time she gets pregnant, right? Because that's how it works. We'd given up on infertility treatments. We'd given up on insurance for three months until it came back. And that's the time we found out on Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, she takes a pregnancy test. She wraps it up and she hands it to me. Merry Christmas. And I was hoping for Ocean's Eleven that year on DVD. <laughs> Definitely improvement, right? So nine months later, Rebecca is born. And, and for the first time, this, this little child, I, I'm a dad. I'm a dad. And I've got to get healthy for her. I've got to lose the weight because I need to be there because she's going to grow up and she's going to get married. She's going to graduate. She's going to win a Nobel Peace Prize. She's going to cure cancer and she's going to become the president of the United States. No pressure, right? She's going to do all these things and I've got to be there to see it all happen. That's, that's the thing though about roles that they're not always successful. I want, I want to tell you a little bit about an exercise I take people through because the challenge is, is your roles don't typically help you transform anything. So what I do is I tell people, I want you to imagine that you've been transported to 
a secret place. No one else is around. It's not necessarily paradise, but it's nice. You're not in danger. And you have no roles. You're not mom. You're not friend. You're not sister. You're not CEO. You're not customer service person. You're nothing. You're just you in this silent, secret place. And you're going to live out the rest of your days there. You have no roles. No roles. No responsibilities. On a scale of 0 to 10, what is your value to the world? What is your value to the world with zero roles? Now, by raise of hand, who says I'm a 5, 4 to 7, let's say. 4 to 7. Okay. How about 1 to 3? Or 0 to 3? We've got a lot of those, right? How about 8 to 10? 1. What is your name? Ian. Ian has courage. Because some of you are thinking maybe it's 8 to 10. You didn't want to raise your hand, but Ian's like, I don't care. Yep, I'm saying it. Good for you, Ian. I love it. Now, here's the thing. Newborn baby, no roll. Scale of 0 to 10. Does anyone say that baby is less than a 10 in value to humanity? Nobody, right? Unless you're a serial killer and don't raise your hand. Okay, good. Um, everyone says a baby is a 10 with no rolls. A baby is a 10. Why? Because a baby is a blank check. Right? We all believe that. A baby like Rebecca could grow up to be the president, Nobel Prize winner, cancer. I say that and you guys chuckle, but you think, well, she could do it, right? Because a baby is a blank check. You're still a blank check. You're still a 10. But somewhere along the line, like, like everyone, we get beat up. We get a teacher that tells us we don't have dexterity, that we can't move right. We get someone that tells us we're big boned or we were born to be obese or we were born to be a certain thing and we start to believe it. It sinks into our heart and it transforms us in a negative way. So that is what happened. I wanted to be a dad, that was my role, but Rebecca still loved me and that was bad for my weight loss. Because guess what, I didn't need to lose weight to make her happy. She loved me no matter how heavy I was, as your kids do, right? People love you no matter what you look like or how much you weigh. That is the challenge with that as a motivation for weight loss because it doesn't last. It never lasts. It never lasts. So attempt three, last attempt, health. So what happened is I used to work for a company that was based in Montana. Um, and if you've ever been to Montana, they don't fly like normal airplanes there because there aren't enough people that want to go to Montana. Unfortunately, it's beautiful. So you have to get on these little planes. They, this company wanted to hire me, but in the last interview, they confessed to me. They said, Tim, we don't know if we can hire you because we don't think you can fit on the plane. We don't think you can fit on the plane. They're being, they're being honest. They weren't being rude about it. Totally nice. Uh, they actually paid <coughs> for me to get on one of these planes. I went out there. I did fit. Needed one of these nice little seat belt extenders, but everything was fine. Eventually, another guy joined the company who was just as heavy as I was, and we were a great comedic duo. Me and, and Caesar was his name. And Caesar and I, we got on these planes and we were fine. We sat next to each other and we laughed the whole way. Nobody's sitting there between us, you know? Like, we thought it was funny. Well, then Caesar did something terrible. He lost weight. How dare Caesar, right? He comes to the next meeting and he lost 200 pounds. He looked great. Wanted to punch him. So mad, right? But he looked great. And so Caesar, I reached out to him and I asked him for help. I asked him for help. And he never responded until six months later. And he said, thanks, Tim. I had a personal moment. I'll have to share it with you. Uh, that's what really set it off. How are you doing? This was six months later. Between that moment and this moment, there's so many pints of ice cream, so many large pizzas. It's over. It's over. All desire is gone. And it wasn't until, and I replied, I said, tell me your moment, but he, then he never got back to me. I never got the help that I thought that I needed. I was dependent on it. I thought I couldn't succeed without his help. Uh, last year, I got a message from Caesar on LinkedIn, of all places. Uh, just had a quick second, saw your picture, great job on your weight loss, you look great. And I wanted to reply, but I realized that's not fair. Caesar, in reality, is not the reason that I didn't lose weight. And I want to be very clear about that. I was dependent on someone else, and that's why that time didn't succeed. So the reality is I, I tried everything, you know, low carb, cabbage soup, Slim Fast, Subway, South Beach, Body for Life, Weight Watchers, OptiFast. Basically from South Beach to North Pole, I have literally tried every single diet at some point or another, 
anything in between. So this time, this time what happened? So I'm going to tell you my moment, my transformation moment and why it occurred. I was preparing a lesson for a class that I was asked to teach and it was uh, a class about that was designed to teach college students uh, about some of the struggles they're going through and how to overcome them. And when you go to college, you're faced with some things that you've never seen before, right? And so this book, this, this lesson manual had, was designed in such a way that it was going to prepare them and the way it said to do it was take these tennis balls and write the names of things that these kids would be struggling with in school. Throw all six at someone, best part of the lesson, you get to throw stuff, and they won't be able to catch all six, but if you throw one at a time, they can catch them and they can handle their challenges if they just deal with them one at a time. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Great advice from a 450 pound guy that I was about to give. So the names of these struggles, these sins that the book referred to them as, sexual promiscuity, violent anger, cheating and dishonesty, drug usage, and unhealthy eating habits. Now the first four, I was on board, yeah, don't do any of those things, kids. How dare you? But I saw that fifth one in that list and it didn't feel like it belonged there. It hurt me. It cut me to the bone. And I had this moment where I thought, I would never in a million years openly perform any of those first four things. And yet here I was every single day doing number five doing number five and seeing it there just really, really struck a chord with me. And it seems harsh, but it's exactly what I needed to hear because I realized at that moment that it wasn't Jean's fault. It wasn't Rebecca's fault and it wasn't Caesar's fault. I had made a conscious decision to live a half life and that's what I was doing. I was settling every single day of my life. So to end it on a Beatles note, like, or at least this part of the story, we're gonna get into the four changes here. Like all great stories, mine is a love story. Everything amazing performed in history was done in the name of love. The first attempt, I tried to do it because I loved Gene. At least I thought I did. Probably didn't, it was a teenage thing, right? And then I did it because I loved Rebecca. And then I did it because my friend did it and I thought he was gonna help me. But it wasn't until I made a conscious decision to love myself, until I said, you deserve a better life, you deserve to be your best self, that I was able to actually make a change that lasted. And that's when I found the appropriate motivation. I did it for me. So we'll start, November 2010, this is where I'm at. We're gonna talk about the four things that I did that made this work and made this stick. Um, and why it lasted. So the first thing is I finally had the right motivation and that's what we're talking about here, self-love. My motivation was intrinsic, intrinsic. Let me tell you a little bit of a, a study here that'll help you understand intrinsic motivation. So I wanna talk to you about flossing for a second. Who flosses, ra- no, don't raise your hand, okay. <laughs> Who likes flossing? Does anyone in the room like flossing? One, great teeth. My cousins, great teeth. Great teeth, for sure, right? Nobody likes flossing. So the University of Chicago took two people and they took two research groups, rather. Group one, they encouraged them to floss and what they taught them about was the typical things, why do we floss, why do we floss? Keep our teeth clean, gum health, right? That's what they taught them. They taught them about dental hygiene, right? Really exciting. We're not gonna talk about that tonight. Group two, they talked to them about focusing on the way they felt after they flossed. The freshness in their mouth, the clean feeling, the happy feeling of knowing that you're not gonna disappoint your dentist, right? All of these wonderful feelings, they had these, they focused on themselves. And what they found at the end of the study, they looked at these two groups, and after a few weeks, they found that those who had stayed focused on the feelings, rather than the the book knowledge, right? The science behind flossing, had flossed more regularly, more regularly. They gave them the same floss, right? Same floss, same type of people, but the ones that were focused on doing it for the right, re- for the feeling, for feeling good, actually stuck to it, and the other ones didn't. So you can take that away and floss with that, for sure, right? If you wanna be a more regular flosser. But you can also apply this to weight loss, right? 
Because we, we try to lose weight for the wrong reasons, right? Here's three. Has, you know, don't raise your hand. Have you ever tried to lose weight for a bathing suit, right? Because summer is coming. Every magazine starting in March runs summer is coming, right? At my gym, I cannot find a parking space January 1st to January 8th. Just none. New Year's resolutions, right? Number one New Year's resolution is weight loss, year after year. We like that New Year's resolution so much, we set it every single year, right? That's why we, we think we're, this is the year, right? And I did it too, we all do it. Maybe we did it for a high school reunion. You know, I'm gonna show those girls, you know, I'm gonna rock that dress. Maybe we did it for a, a girl or a guy, a potential date, right? All of these reasons fail you. All of these reasons fail you. So this is one of the first questions I ask people when they reach out to me for weight loss help. You know, people ask me, can you give me a meal plan? So I have a confession to make. Meal plans don't, they don't work very well at all. Like when I first lost the weight, I had people reach out to me and they're like, I want to lose weight. I'm like, I got a meal plan for you. I can't wait to send it to you. And I would send them a meal plan and then we talk like every day for five days and then they would block me on Facebook because <laughs> they would fall off the meal plan, right? And I was like, my meal plan's gotta get better. So I started researching and I started developing better meal plans that also got me blocked on Facebook, right? Like I'm stalking them, but they reached out to me for help, right? I wanna help. I asked people, why are you doing this? Because I wanna know. I had a guy reach out to me recently and he wrote me a love letter basically about this girl. He had fallen in love with her. He was a professional photographer. He had taken photographs of this model. He sent me pictures of her. She was like an 85 on a scale of one to 10, gorgeous. And he was in love, he was in love. And I said, why are you doing this? He said, well, I'm doing this because I deserve it, but I also want to get the girl. I said, what happens if and when she moves on? He said, no, I'm sticking to it 100%. He has me blocked on Facebook right now. True story, right? I can't get through to him. I actually started following her on Instagram because I like want to see, is she going to post a picture with him? I'm kind of stalking her a little bit, right? I want to see if it happens, but he's dropped off. He's dropped off completely. In the end, to quote the great philosopher Walter White from Breaking Bad, I love Breaking Bad. It's kind of a secret confession. And so Walter White says this thing at the end of the show. This is not a spoiler, but he said, referring to what he did, which wasn't good stuff, uh, I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. And I was really, I was, I was alive. It's this great pivotal moment where he's explaining to his wife why he, in his case, went off the deep end, right? But he wasn't motivated by the money or by anything crazy. He just liked it. He felt good. And that's why the weight loss stuck for me. I had the right motivation. For once, I was losing weight, and it felt good because I decided I was doing it for me. I was doing it for the right reasons. Second thing that made me really successful this time is I had really simple framework. So I'm going to share with you, I had three rules for food that I started off with. It wasn't like anything crazy or shake-based. I, I didn't have any pills, nothing, no wrapping. Um, although I do want to learn how that works, the wrapping. But anyway, um, these were my three eating rules that I started with. The first rule was no sugar. None, zero, period. Second one was no white flour or pasta, which was a hard one for me to commit to because I was a big pasta guy. Um, and then I wanted to focus on whole foods. And so this was kind of my little hack to only buy whole foods. If I was going to buy food that came in a package, I would look on the back of the package at the ingredients. And if I didn't know where I could buy every single ingredient in the grocery store, then I wouldn't buy the package. So what that did for me is I thought to myself, well, I could cook this because I know where all these ingredients are, but I'm lazy and this is easier, right? So that's okay sometimes, right? That's okay. But these were my three rules. And I'm not suggesting that this is the only way to lose weight. It's not. Uh, I've done a lot of weight loss podcasts and some of my favorite shows, they, they tell stories from people that have lost weight and people lose weight doing all kinds of stuff. Vegan, vegetarian, paleo, primal, low carb, no carb, low fat, high fat. People do crazy things. Uh, there's those people that are blending, you know, butter in their coffee and that's working great. You know, cool, whatever. Just find a system and stick to it, right? So today, uh, you know, I am a paleo guy, but I'm not religious about it, you know, um, Anyone heard the joke about paleo? How do you know that somebody eats paleo? Don't worry, they'll tell you. So um, that, that's kind of the, the paleo joke, right? This is what I try to make my plate look like, okay? Uh, animals on one side and plants on the other side. And they can be mixed together in a salad, right? But that's basically what I look, when I sit down to eat at a restaurant, in fact, true story, we, we just went to Chili's 
and I got the margarita chicken. It came with tortilla strips on it. I told them to leave the strips off, and they wanted to give me rice and beans, and I said, can you give me veggies? They said, we have broccoli, and I said, perfect. So it was chicken with tomato on top and then broccoli on the side. It, it, was, it was this plate, and on the side I had water. I sometimes still have Diet Coke, confession, weight loss confession, right? That's my one vice. I do have Diet Coke. That's my one non-paleo thing. But that worked for me. But the point is, is you have to have a system. See, I believe in the system of shuhari. Shuhari is a Japanese technique. Shu means, I always forget this, hold, break, and leave. So shu is hold. So you learn a system and you start with the shu phase. And shu basically means you stick to the system religiously. Religi religiously. And by religiously, I don't mean you're doing missionary work, okay? Uh, but some people do that with their diets, and that is the quickest way to lose friends. Had someone reach out to me on Twitter recently. They said, ever since I went paleo, no one will go out to lunch with me. And I replied to her, and I said, no, no, no. Ever since you wouldn't stop talking about going paleo, nobody wants to go to lunch with you. <laughs> like, I just had lunch at Chili's, and it was not obnoxious when I ate chicken and broccoli. I just did it. I didn't have to talk about it, right? I'm talking about it now because it's relevant. But that's the shoe phase. The ha phase is when you start to learn how to apply rules. You start to bend rules a little bit and you see how it applies to your life and how you might be able to make little adjustments here and there. So shoe might be a whole 30. Ha might mean a little bit of transition into paleo. So maybe you think of a Diet Coke once in a while. And re is when you kind of throw out the rules and just live according to the principles that you've learned. You live according to the principles you've learned. The reality of, of eating is that it, it probably doesn't matter when it comes to weight loss. And when I say it doesn't matter, of course, nutrition is 80 to 90% of this journey. But at the end of the day, this is something that I tell people all the time. You are far more likely to have weight problems because of the stuff you put in your head than because of the stuff you put in your mouth. Especially where I was at. You don't get to 450 pounds because you don't realize that Cheetos are bad for you, right? You get there because you're destroying yourself. And you know it. And you're allowing it to happen. If I can make a suggestion when it comes to food is start from a position of nutritional mindfulness. Realize what you're eating and why. Don't strive for perfection. Now, I was in a different place. I like to tell people that when it came to unhealthy food, I was an alcoholic. I couldn't afford cheat days because all it would take is one trip through a Del Taco drive through and I would be off the wagon. Do we have Del Taco in Utah? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Those spicy chicken burritos were my poison, right? One, and I'd be 400 pounds next week. That's what I'll tell people, even now. I was addicted. I was in a different place. But at least start from a position where you know what you're eating and you know why you're eating it. So the third thing that I did is I had support. So. When I first decided I was going to lose weight, I had my three rules and I was going to Subway every day and I was having a Subway salad because that Jared guy did it and I kind of looked like him, like a little bit, right? Kind of looked like Jared in that picture, maybe? Yeah. So I used to get that a lot, right? I would go into Subways and people, and I actually, I was working for a credit card processor and Jared was our spokesperson because he used credit cards to buy all his Subways. And then I signed up 10,000 Subways to take credit cards. And so like, they would, I would walk in, they'd be like, Jared, you gained the weight back. And I'm like, no, 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 it's cool. He's, he's still skinny, I'm somebody else, right? So I thought I would go to Subway, and it worked out. Um, then I met Brett. This is Brett in the back. And you can't really see him because of the lighting, but Brett has negative 5% body fat. Like he comes into a room and it's like, he sucks the fat out of the room. Like people get skinnier around him, he's that healthy. Like he looks like, if he were to take off his shirt, if you ever looked at an anatomy textbook and you remember like the diagrams of like the muscles where the skin's removed, that's what Brett looks like. It's unhealthy how muscular this guy is. Um, he doesn't have skin, like you can't pinch, uh, it's, it's unreal. Anyway, Brett, he heard I was trying to lose weight. He said, I'm gonna help you. He jumps in my car with a notebook and he writes, scrawls out a meal plan. And then from that day forward, every single day he called me. I actually shared a Google Calendar with him and planned all my workouts and he would hold me accountable. He'd call me up and be like, how was your back day? How was your back day? And I'd be like, I did it, don't worry, like stop, you're, gonna, you're hurting me. So like he was really like on me. He was my support, he was my friend. And I know, you know, we don't always have this. So, you know, he gave me this idea though that day in my car when he wrote down that meal plan, he told me, he said, you know, if you stick with this, you could be down 100 pounds by next Christmas. So this is like November 15th, you know, 
Perfect time to lose weight, by the way. I chose to start losing weight November 5th, right? Right before Thanksgiving and Christmas, brilliant, right? There's a reason why you do New Year's resolutions on New Year's Day, right? But I, this is the time I chose and that's, that's just what worked. Can I tell you, by the way, one of the number one signs you're not ready to lose weight is you're waiting for January 1st. It's not gonna work then either, right? Why January 1st? This health food on sale, like I haven't found a sale, the health food sale that starts on January 1st. So, Brett told me this, and what I heard when he said it is I heard him say that he believed in me. The first person that ever looked in my eye and he said, I believe you can do this. I can make, I can make this happen. For the first time, that thought sunk 12 inches from my head to my heart, and it stuck there. I believe in you. That's what he told me. Now, what happens if you don't have this person? I get this email a lot. People asking why well, I have sabotagers, I have haters. True story, first day I decided to lose weight, I come home, I told my, my uh, now ex-wife, I told her I'm losing weight, I come in the door, and she's bought a pizza for her and the girls. And I look at them like, ouch, you know, this is gonna be hard, but I can do it. I did not have that pizza, by the way. Um, so what if you don't have those people? So I'm gonna give you a few resources you can use if you don't have a great friend. The first resource is Reddit. Anyone familiar with Reddit? Now, when I say this, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, Reddit? That's a place where weirdos hang out. There is a subreddit called Lose It. So it's reddit.com slash r slash lose it. This is the first time I saw, I saw a before picture there a few days into my weight loss journey that changed my life. And I stayed there. It's a great community. So you can find an online community. It doesn't even have to be Reddit, but that one worked for me. Stay off of the other subreddits, not family friendly. Lose It, very good. Okay. Um, so yeah, the second resource is there are so many great weight loss podcasts out there. Podcasts, if you're not familiar, are free. You can go to a website, you click play. We all have smartphones in here, uh, probably, uh, or an iPod or an iPad. We all have these devices. There are great resources. I, I've listed three here. Tips of the Scale is a podcast. He puts out podcasts once or twice a week, and he just has people telling their weight loss success stories. I listen to every single one of them, even today. I mean, I'm there, I'm done with that part of my life, but I love hearing how other people did it. It keeps my mind in that success place. The second one is Primal Potential. This one is slightly more scientific. Her name is Elizabeth. She's like one of my best friends. She's so smart, it's annoying. Um, but she will teach you everything you need to know about losing weight. She also has great guests. And then Half Size Me, they also tell a bunch of stories over there. Uh, her name is Heather, also incredible. Um, Elizabeth definitely is more female friendly. She talks a lot about like how female hormones interact with, it, does Elizabeth have any listeners? I should ask her that, she'd be so happy. You listen to Elizabeth? She's awesome. All right, what's that? Primal Potential? She's great. This is Sam and that's Heather. So love all of them, they're great people. The third resource is online. There's a lot of great websites. This is mine, Tinier Tim. Um, and I actually bring this up because I had one guy reach out to me once uh, recently, uh, six months ago. He's in Arizona. He's yo-yoed a hundred times. He says, I cannot figure out how to stick to it. And he wrote me a letter that was like, it was like a, uh, an epistle. I mean, it was amazing. He was such a great writer. And I said, here's an idea. Why don't you start writing about your journey? Journal it. Maybe that can help you stick to it. And he's done it. And he's lost 75 pounds last time he emailed me. He hasn't released any of his writings, but I hope he will. Because I bet they're way better than mine. Like he's really, really sharp. And writing held him accountable. So whatever it takes, that's another resource, another way to support. Either go to other blogs or start your own. Start your own. Everyone starts Instagram accounts. I get follows every single day from people that are like so-and-so's fitness journey. I also have my personal account. And they post like their food and their workouts and their selfies in the gym mirror. And you know, like that's what they do, right? I love that. Follow me on your account. At Tinier Tim, by the way. If you're not following me on Instagram, I would love that. Uh, that would be awesome. Uh, the fourth thing that really worked for me is consistency. Consistency. That's me in an old pair of my pants, by the way. If I can make a suggestion, as you lose weight, throw out your pants, except for one. You know, save one for that picture, right? But don't burn the ships, right? Don't go back. So what type of consistency am I talking about? Well, 24-hour fitness, and I'm not endorsing them. This is not a sales pitch. But if you want to join a gym, they're great, they're fine. Uh, they actually track your, your logins, logins, your visits, right? 
And so every single time you visit, they tell you. And so I was able to go back after two years and pull all my gym records. And it turned out that in two years, I had worked out 449 times, which is 19 workouts a month. 19 workouts a month. So that's an average of four a week-ish, five a week almost. Um, that's how often I was working out. Now, a lot of people say I don't have time to work out that much. And I think that's cute. I, I think that if I told you I had a million dollars if you worked out five times a week, or a billion dollars, or you know, whatever, you, you'd make time, you'd find it, right? If you had the right motivation. The reality is, is the how is not the hard part, right? It's the why that's the hard part. You can definitely make time for this. The way that I made time, and I still do this practice every Sunday night, I go to my Google Calendar and I plan out when my workouts are gonna be that week. I plan out what I'm gonna do and where I'm gonna do it. And this is a habit. Like I have not, not worked out at least three times in a week in five years, like never. It never happens. It's that ingrained in me as a habit and I still every Sunday sit down and plan out when I'm gonna be working out that week. And I release the schedule. I tell people, like this is it, it's, it's on there. And if you want my time, it's not available this time, this time, this time. It's a big rock, right? To use the Stephen R. Covey thing, uh, it's a big rock, you, you make time for it. You plan it first, right? You plan it first. Um, so the second way I was consistent is with cheat meals. So I already talked about the fact that I felt like I was an alcoholic. I never introduced cheat meals. And I, I'll tell you the problem with cheat meals is cheat meals become cheat days and cheat days become cheat weeks and cheat weeks become cheat months. And I basically had to cheat 31 years and it didn't work out for me. So I decided that I wasn't gonna do cheat meals. It was the best thing that I ever did for myself. And I'm not saying that's the same thing you do with everyone, but be nutritionally mindful. If you are gonna work it in, work it in and don't even call it a cheat meal, right? I don't like this term to be quite honest because it makes it sound like you're married to your, your diet and you're not. I mean, unless you did, which is crazy, right? Don't propose to your diet. You are not till death do you part, right? You're eating a way, you're the way you're eating for a goal, for a purpose. Everything you put into your body is fuel and use it accordingly. So how did it go? No cheat meals, I used all my four systems, everything went. This is a, a short little video in 15 seconds showing my transformation. So, Brett had told me if I stick with this by next year, I could be down 100 pounds. And I lost 200 pounds in one year. And nine days. I put that in really small font. I was so mad. I was so close to doing it right on the one year, but I just couldn't do it. Um, one year and nine days, I lost my first 200 pounds. 200 pounds in a year. Now, when I did it, I didn't think that was like remarkable or, or even interesting to be quite honest. People would say like, whoa, whoa, you know, true story. Uh, I went to a, a wedding and I was still married at the time. I walk in and my wife's cousin comes in and I say, hey, how are you doing? And we're talking and she's like acting really strange to me, really rude almost. And she leaves and she, her daughter comes running back in a few minutes later and she said, she just asked me when Tiffany got divorced and why she's dating this guy. That's, I mean, that's how fast it happened. I went from looking like that guy to looking like what I look like today. And people, like I still see people that I haven't seen in a few years and they, they have no idea who I am, which is fun, a lot of fun. Uh, so in one year, I started November 5th. This was a Thanksgiving day run the next year. I ran a 5K uh, in Dana Point, uh, Turkey Trot. I ran on Thanksgiving day. 